Hello, everyone. Welcome to the post contest discussion for the Lead Code Weekly Contest 426 MJ. Let's move on to the first question. Okay. The first question uh, smallest number with all set bits. This number in this question basically we were given an integer n and we have to find the smallest number x which is greater than or equal to n such that all the bits in the binary representation of x are set and basically here they define what is a bit in binary representation let's look at the sample test cases So the first test case they give n equal to 5 and for that the smallest x is 7. So initially they give n equal to 5. Uh, if you look at n in binary representation 5 is 4 plus 1. So 4 is a power of 2. This should be 1. And So in binary, 5 will be represented as 101. And for this, they say that the smallest number x, which is greater than or equal to n, and whose all set bits, and I think people are trying. So for this uh, n equal to 5, they said that the smallest number x, uh, which is greater than or equal to n and whose all bits are set is 7. Now if you look at the binary representation of 7, well 7 is represented as 4 plus 2 plus 1, which is like 1, 1, 1 in binary. So this will be like 1, 1, 1 in binary. and for the next test case, like for next test case, we have n equal to 10. And for this, the answer is x equal to 15. Uh, if you look at the binary representation of 10, 10 can be represented as 8 plus 2. So that would be 1, 0, 1, 0 and 2. And 15 can, is like 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. So that is 1, 1, 1, 1 in binary base 2. And for the final test case, uh, for n equal to 3, we have the answer x is equal to 3. Uh, if you look at the binary representation of 3, it is 1, 1. That is basically 2 plus 1 equal to 3. And the binary representation of x2 is uh, 1, 1. That is 2 plus 1 equal to 3. So, and the constraints on n were that n is greater than or equal to 1, less than or equal to 1000 that is 10 raised to the power 3. So now if we uh, look at the intuition for this problem like basically if you look at all the now basically if we look at all the test cases uh, for which we have an answer for So for n is equal to, well, 5, for n equal to 10, and for n equal to 3, our answer x is, for 5, the answer is 7, for 10, it is 15, for 3, it is 3. And uh, the binary representation of 5 is 101, uh, this is 1010, and this is 11, this is base 2. And the binary representation of 7 is 1, 1, 1, base 2. Uh, this is 1, 1, 1, 1, base 2. And this is 1, 1, base 2. So basically, if you look at uh, all the n x pair, so what you can see is that in an optimal scenario, what we basically want to do is we, we wish to first represent and then some binary format 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 1. And then uh, the optimal answer that is the least x such that x is greater than or equal to n. Uh, from these test cases, we can kind of see that what we uh, what is happening is that all these 0 bits are being set to 1 bit. So basically this is like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 
and this zero bit is set to one bit and this. So this is kind of the intuition that we get from uh, looking at the sample test cases given to us. Uh, now let's move on to why does this work? So the first thing you have to notice is that, so if n is some integer like uh, one one zero zero one. So this bit is like this is uh, this one represent two to the power zero. This represents two to the power one, two, three, and two to the power four. So that is this is the most significant bit of the n. Now for x to be greater than equal to n, x has to have at least like uh x can have like two conditions like uh, either the most significant bit of x is uh, greater than n, like x has a significant bit set somewhere over here. Otherwise, if the significant bit of x is same as n, so like n has its fifth bit, like uh, the fifth bit 2 to the power 4 is set to 1. So either x can have like 2 to the power 5 set to 1. But in that case, like we'll have a suboptimal answer because like 2 to the power 5 is greater than any number uh, that lies in within these four. So an optimal answer, what we want to do is we want to have the uh, most significant bit of n and most significant bit of x to be similar. So in that case, basically you have x is equal to the most significant bit of x and n are similar like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So you have five places to fill over here. And basically you need to fill all the places with ones because in our question, it's given that x must have all its bits set to one. Okay, and uh, to do this, uh, what you can just do is iterate over all the powers of two uh, such that they are less than equal to n, and then uh, set if the kth bit of n is zero, then set it one. So basically, if you have one zero zero one, then start iterating from like uh, the two to power zero. This is one, so let it be one. Then two to power one, this is zero, set it to one. Two to power two, this is zero, set it to one. This is one, uh, keep it as it is. So that would be how you could uh, like iterate over this. And let's just move on to code since this is like, okay, yeah. Over here you could see like uh, kind of what we are doing. So we are starting with a mask. So this is like, we are starting iterating from the rightmost bit that is two to the power zero, that is one. And then while this mask is strictly less than N, that is the uh, most significant bit of N, and we like shift mass to left that is similar as multiplying it by two we or it with n that is if the i uh, keep bit of n is set then keep it as it is if it is zero set it to one so let's just dry run through this code uh, for once uh, i'll take the condition of n equal to five so five is one zero one two initially like mask will be one in this case, five or one will be like one zero one or one, which is uh one zero one five itself. Then you'll have mask will be shifted to left, that will become two, which is one zero modulo two. And so five that is one zero one or two that is one zero, we'll get one, and this bit will be odd with this, so we'll have a one over here and one order two uh so and finally like when mask becomes four we have one zero zero modular two or it with this and we have one 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 which is seven similarly for all the other test cases uh, the space co time complexity for this code will be big of log n because we are basically iterating over all the bits of n and the number of bits in n is always uh, logarithm of n base 2 and the space complexity would be big of 1 because we are only creating constant variable no arrays and as such. Okay. Uh, I don't think there are any doubts. So let's move on to the next question. The second question, uh, the second question is identify the largest outlier in an array. Uh, basically in this question, we are given an array of integers nums. Uh, the size of this array was n and n was at least two. So according to countries like n was at least three. And it was given that 
exactly n minus two of these elements were special numbers. We were given, we weren't said which numbers are special numbers, but we are just given that n minus two of these numbers are special numbers. And so we have n minus two special number and of the remaining two elements, one of them is some of these special numbers and the other is an outlier. And outlier is basically they give a definition that outlier is someone who is not a special number and neither the sum of these special numbers. So, and we had to give, uh, we had to find that what is the largest possible potential outlier out of these numbers. So, and also one more thing we were given that outlier and sum can't be same, but they can have similar values, but they can't be same. So let's just first move through a test case. So in this test case, uh, we are given that the array size is two, uh, the array is two, three, five, ten, and we are given our nums array to be two, three, five, and ten. And uh, it was, the answer they have given is 10. So let's see how they have said that it is 10. So what they're saying is that, uh, okay, this is an array of size n equal to one, two, three, four. Out of these, we have two special numbers. Uh, one is the sum of special numbers and one is an outlier. Okay. So, uh, well, let's just consider what will happen if like 2, 3, 5, and 10. So if we assign 2 and 3 to be the special number, so if 2 is a special number and 3 is a special number, and we have exactly two special numbers, so we have to assign exactly two special numbers. Then 2 plus 3, 5, so one of the remaining numbers has to be 5, which is the sum of these two numbers. So 5 is a number, and we can have 10 as an outlier. It may have been possible that there were multiple outliers. In that case, we have to take the maximum. So we have our answer 10 over here. Uh, in any other case, this would not work. For example, if we take 2, 3, 5, 10, and if we consider that 3 and 5 are our special numbers, in that case, the sum of our special numbers is 3 plus 5 equal to 8. But 8 is not a part of our array. So we can't have 3 and 5 as our special numbers. Uh, consider some other case like 2, 3, 5, 10, and if we take two and five as a, our special numbers, then two plus five is seven, but seven is not a part of the remaining numbers, which are three and 10. So we can't take two and five as special numbers too. So basically the only ones we can take a special number are two and three. And yes, uh, let's take the third and the numbers can be negative too. So in the second test case, basically we have minus two, minus one, minus three, minus six and four. And in this case, like uh, we take our special numbers to be two minus one minus three, uh, the sum is minus six. So one of the remaining number six is our sum and four is our outlier. So uh, our maximum outlier is four. We can check that no, no other numbers satisfy this condition and let's move on to the last sample test case which is one 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 and i think we have five times one and two fives okay so in this case you can take one two three four five these five numbers as special numbers and we are left with these two numbers and we can take any of them as a sum and any of them as an outlier Basically, the sum of these five numbers uh, ends up being five. So any of them can be a sum and any of them can be an outlier. And this is allowed like the values of sum and outlier can be same. Uh, it is okay, just that they have to lie at different indices. So in this case, our maximum outlier is five. Okay. And now moving on to uh, the intuition for this problem. So let's just say that the total sum, like total, uh, 
uh, is like basically uh, so I think the nums would be a bit difficult. So let's just consider that the array is like a zero, a one, all the way up to a of n minus one. Now let's just say that this total is the total sum of all the elements, not just the n minus one special numbers, but the sum of all the elements. Okay, and consider that uh, the sum of special numbers is say sum. Okay, and so basically, uh, if I were to take uh, this test case, uh, let's just take the first test case, two, three, five, ten, right? So we have our test case, two, three, five, and ten. In this case, the total sum would be like two plus three plus five plus ten. This will be five plus five, ten plus ten, twenty, right? And our special numbers are 2 and 3. So our sum of special numbers is 2 plus 3, 5. And our outlier is 10. Okay. Now, if you just uh, see at what's happening over here, uh, let's just derive a relationship between these three numbers. So you have this 2, 3, 5, and 10. This guy is the outlier, right? This guy is the sum and the remaining array, this is the special array. So this remaining array is the special array. And what we can see is that the sum of this special array is equal to this sum. Right. So basically, and uh, the sum of all these elements is total. So basically, what we can see is that total is the sum of the special array, which is going to be the sum element, plus the sum element itself, which is like uh, five over here, plus uh, the outlier, right? Let's just say that uh, we represent the sum element by X outlier by Y, then our total sum can be represented as two X plus Y. So basically, uh, when can we have, like what I'm trying to say is, if I pick two elements to be the remaining elements and say rest of the array, two elements X and Y to be the remaining elements and say that the rest of the array is my special array. When is it valid? When is it valid? When can I say this thing? Well, I can say this thing uh, when let's just say the rest of the array, sum of rest of the array is X, then uh, this equation must hold. Like if this equation holds for any two of the elements and X and Y can, can't be on the same, same index, they have to be on different index. So if this thing holds like two into X plus Y, then some of the rest of elements is X and I have an element with value X and I have an element with value Y. So I can have Y as an outlier. Y can be a outlier. Okay. And so this is the idea. And what we can do is we can basically uh, like, right, uh, so Y is an outlier. And now even this would be like with the given constraints, I think it's 10 power five. So one possible brute force solution over here would have been like basically we iterate over all I equal to zero to N minus one and go to J equal to like I plus one, sorry. I plus one to N minus one, and that would give us an O of N squared solution. But since N over here is like 10 power five, N is up to 10 power five. So we need an solution that is something like O of N or O of big O of N log N uh, time complexity, something that lies in this range or this range. So this won't work outright, but we have this information that if uh, like X is sum plus Y is an outlier, then there's this equation must hold that two X plus Y equal to total. Okay, now consider when can the ith element a of i, if there is any arrangement under this, if a of i is an outlier, okay, then you have a certain element x, like x, this can be the sum and a of i is the outlier, then this element 2x plus a of i can be satisfied. Total. So what we are trying to do over here is we are trying to fix the outlier. So I can iterate over all the array and try to fix the ith element. So can I have the ith element as an outlier? 
what what we are trying to do is can i have the ith element as an outlier i can have the ith element as an outlier if there is some other element x such that 2 into x plus a of i is equal to total and basically what we can have we can derive an equation for this thing like a of i into minus 2 into x sorry uh, I, so I derived the wrong equation, I guess. Yes. Yeah. So the total is fixed. The total is sum of the array. And we can iterate over all i and we can just fix a of i for each iteration. So this number is fixed. And we can just say that x is equal to basically total minus a of i divided by 2. Of course, we have to check if this is divisible by 2. And uh, if it's not divisible, then uh, we can't really consider x because we don't have fractional values and we can just check if an x uh, if there is some number x in the rest of the array also uh, one more thing that we can do is like we can try to fix x so this was after fixing y so we've said y is equal to a of i we can also do something like x is equal to a of i so i am fixing x so for this x, do we have another uh, like y which can be an outlier? So in that case, you have like our equation 2x plus y equal to total becomes 2 into a of i plus y equal to total. Our equation becomes 2 into a of i equal to total. So our y becomes total minus 2 into a of i. So if this uh, number exists in our array for each, or, each i and it is not equal to a of i, then we can have this number as an outline. Basically, that's what we are uh, saying over here. So let me just uh, like walk you through how uh, we could proceed for this our sample test case. Um, initially, you have a of i equal to two. Let's try fixing x equal to two. Then uh, and our total over here is twenty, right? Our total is twenty. We can fix x equal to 2, then our y will equal to total minus 2x, which is 20 minus 2 twos of 4, which is 16. But 16 is not in the array, so we can't have this as an outlier. Let's try fixing x equal to 3. We'll have y equal to 20 minus 3 to the 6, which is 14. 14 is not in our array, so this can't be an outlier. We can try fixing uh, x equal to the third element, 5. y will be 20 minus 5 to the 10, which is 10. 10 is indeed present in the array and 10 is like uh, we have a 10 other than this 5. So 10 can be an outlier. This is an uh, like outlier candidate. One more thing that we can uh, do is try fixing y. Uh, in some cases, this would be required. Like we can fix y equal to 2. In that case, our x will be 20 minus 2 divided by 2, which is 18 by 2, which is 9. Not present in our array. We can fix y equal to 3, x equal to 20 minus 3 by 2, uh, which is 17 by 2. 17 is not divisible by 2, so we can just cut it over here. Similarly, for 5, like x is equal to 20 minus 5 divided by 2, which is 15 divided by 2. 15 is odd, not divisible by 2, so neither this. And y equal to 10, so can 10 be an outlier? In that case, we need to have an x other than this 10 which has value 20 minus 10 divided by 2, 10 divided by 2, which is 5. And we indeed have a 5. So 10 can be an outlier candidate. So this is the like overall idea over here. And this is one way to implement it. Let me just see. I don't think there are any... Yes. Oh, yeah. OK. So, uh, if we uh, over here, like basically what we're doing is we maintain a map is present and we calculate our total. Initially, we just calculate our total and we just say that trace is like the most minimum element that uh, there is in the array. So, the array elements are at least uh, like greater than 10 power minus 10 power 3. So, we just say that. Sorry. We just say that the res is minus 10 power 3 minus 1. Like, minus infinity in a sense <coughs> and we trade our elements in a num uh, first we try to fix this element as sum in that case our i outlier should be uh, this total minus 2 into element so what if my element was 
equal to sum. In that case, this would be my outlier. If my element was equal to outlier, in this case, in that case, this should have been my sum. We check if like I ha have I encountered this outlier. Like if I try to fix my sum, have I encountered the outlier in the array that I have iterated up till now? If yes, then this can be a possible outlier candidate. So I just uh, say that res is maximum of whatever uh, res and the new outlier. And the other thing in this case, like uh, if I try to fix element to be my outlier, in that case, I should have another element by this with this value of sum. I haven't uh, checked if this thing is divisible by two. So we are just checking over here if two into some less element that is our fixed outlier is equal to total. If it's not, then it's not divisible by two and we don't really need to proceed. And the other thing basically is this sum present in our array. If it is, then the current element, which is fixed as outlier right now, is a valid value for an outlier. So we can update our res and we finally say that is present of element is true. Basically we are marking that we have seen this element. So what's happening over here is uh, two, three, five, and 10. First thing we do is we fix our current element to be sum and we see if there's an outlier I have encountered previously. And so in that case, we calculate this outlier value and check if it's present in our is present array. And next we try to say that our current element is an outlier and see if I have encountered and uh, some value possible sum value in my previous array. So we fix this outlier that is uh, my current element and on the basis of that calculate my sum, check if that sum is valid and see if that sum is present in my is present array. If it is, then uh, this outlier is a possible candidate. And if this outlier is possible, it is a kind of possible candidate and we update our this. Uh, speaking of the space uh, time complexity for this code. So the time complexity, as you can see, mostly it is we are iterating over the array and this is an unordered map with an ordered map. This would be big of n log n with an ordered map. This is big of n with possible collisions, uh, which we have, which have to be dealt with, with randomization and the space complexity. So this map takes a uh, big of n space because we are storing every element into this map and rest. We just have our normal uh, constant variables not constant variables, just single variables rather than arrives. So our space complexity would be big of n. Uh, one more possible way to implement this solution would be, yes, uh, like one more thing that we could do is we could kind of maintain a two pointer approach. So basically if you see like uh, what we are doing over here is we want all the X, Y in the array that satisfy this, sorry, I wrote the wrong equation. So basically we want all the x, y in our array that satisfy this equation 2 into x plus y. Now, let's just say that uh, you could satisfy this equation with x equal to 2 and y equal to 4. What happens if you update x equal to 3? So x has increased. In that case, you have to like, uh, so x incremented by 2. So this will be initially this was 2 to the 4. Now this became 2 to the 3 to the 6. So this has to be decremented by 2 that basically this is 2. So basically, whenever your x increases, your y decreases. So you could kind of have a two pointer approach where you start with x, uh, start from x over here in the a of zero element and with a of n minus one element and y over here. Of course, you have to sort the array uh, for this two pointer approach to work prior. And uh, you could just move the pointer of x to the left and move the pointer of y to the right to make sure that this whole equation is satisfied. Uh, that's one more approach, but it's a bit complicated. And overall, this gives a time complexity of big of n log n if the array is not sorted prior, which was the case over here. Okay, now let's move on to problem. Let me see if there are any doubts. Okay, so let's move on to the problem three. Okay. Okay, in problem three, uh, we were given two undirected trees, uh, each with uh, n nodes. The first tree was with n nodes. The second tree was with m nodes. And since it's a tree, like we have n minus one edges, and each node has a label from zero to n minus one, and the other 
tree has labels from 0 to m minus 1. We are given the edges, n minus 1 edges for the first tree, m minus 1 edges for the second tree. This was an undirected tree. And we're also given a definition that basically a node u is a target to node v if the number of edges on path from u to v is less than equal to k. So we're also given this another number k. And so what this says is if the distance of u from v is uh, less than equal to k, like in terms of the number of edges you have to traverse to reach uh, u from v, then u is a target of v. And uh, we had to calculate this answer array for the first tree, that is array of n integers, such that uh, the maximum possible number of targets that you can reach from the ith node is answer of i. Also, you have one more thing that you can attach one node of the first tree to another node of the second tree. And we were also given that the queries were independent. So let's just uh, look at the, like, Problem statement uh, like sample test case uh, for more clarity. Just paste the screenshot over here. Right. So this was a given tree in the sample test case. Like they gave this tree to us in form of edge weights, like edges A of, A of I, B of I. Okay. And over here, we are given that, right. For this test case, yeah. For this test case, we are given k is equal to 2. For this test case, we were given k is equal to 2. And uh, now let's see the answer for the node 0. So what our definition says is that which are the which nodes are target of 0. So okay, from 0, 0 itself is a target of itself in all conditions like basically zero itself is a target of itself so zero itself is a target secondly you could have node one so node one is a distance of one from two so node one is also a target node two is a distance of uh, one from two so it is also a target you can reach node three within like by traversing two edges so it's a distance of two less than equal to k so this two is a target similarly this two is a target basically you have to uh, calculate the number of edges the number of nodes that you can reach by traversing at most k nodes. So basically what you could say is answer of i is the number of nodes uh, which are reachable from i by traversing at most k edges. But the catch over here was that in a general tree, like this would be very easy to implement. But the catch over here was that uh, you had to, uh, like you could add one edge from any node in this tree to any node in this tree. And so after adding that edge, your answer would also be added to like uh, this, this tree two would contribute to your answer. So in this case, like we join the zeroth node of this tree to the zeroth node of this tree. Now after adding this edge, what you have is like this, like zero itself is at a distance of zero. So this node, uh, this is a distance of one, one, two, two. Now you reach this zero after you add this edge, this node is at distance of one from it. So this is included. Uh, so this is a distance of one. This is at distance of two, three. This uh, node three is at distance of, sorry, two. Uh, node one is at distance of two. Node four at distance of three. Five at distance of four. Six at distance of four. Basically, we can include all nodes that are at distance of at max k, that is two, into our answer. So we'll include this, 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 and oppose this. So the total number of nodes we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9. We have 9 nodes, so answer of 0 would be 9, and as it is indeed given over here. And, like, uh, so, okay, let's just uh, take the answer array. So, the answer of 0, we have calculated it to be 9. And now, here's the thing that since you've added this edge for the next, uh, like, node, for the next node, you can once again add a new edge. 
not a new age. Basically, the queries are independent of each other. So if I say for uh, calculating the answer of zero, I added an age from zero to zero. But when I'm calculating answer for say one, I don't really need to consider this age that I added for calculating answer of zero. I can add another age for calculating answer of one from one to zero. And basically uh, now I calculate answer from one. So one itself is reachable. Zero is a distance of, like it's a distance of zero from itself. Zero is a distance of one. Two is a distance of two from it. And these two will be a distance of three. So they won't be considered, but this will be considered. This will be considered. This will be considered. Now in the other tree, the node zero will be a distance of one. These will be a distance of two and the rest of nodes will be a distance of three or four. So will the number of nodes that we are considering one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, and seven. So like we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so I think the next value is seven. And we can just go on calculating uh, so on and so forth for each of the n elements. And we're also given the constraints to be like n and m are between 2 to 10 raised to power 3, that is 1000. So this was the overall problem and the sample test case. Now let's move to see what exactly we are doing over here. So if you look at the, like uh, what we are doing in the first tree. So, okay, let's just see what we are actually doing in the first tree. I will consider the three and four. And over here we have Zero, two, three, a load here, and I guess two nodes over here. All right. So, and let's just say that we are evaluating the node one. Let's see if there are any doubts. Okay. So, let's just say that we are evaluating the node one. So, for i equal to one, I am calculating the answer for i equal to one. Uh, what do I do? The first thing I need to traverse and include all the nodes in the first tree that are of distance of at at most two, like first, what we do is in tree one, add all nodes which are at distance less than equal to k. So over here, this distance is basically less than equal to two. So this can be done with a basic DFS. And since we have like n is up to uh, 1000, we can just uh, DFS from each of the nodes uh, that that would have a time complexity of n squared, which would fit in the given constraints. So first we can just DFS from here and we can include all the nodes which are at distance of at most two. Okay. Uh, the next thing that we do is we join this node one with one of the nodes zero. Okay. And then I also need to start a DFS in this uh, second tree. What I want to do is I want to find all the nodes in this tree, which are at a distance of at most K from one. Now let's see how are the distances in this tree related. So zero is at distance of one. These are at distance of two. Distance of two. Uh, this node is at distance of three. And the final node is at distance of four. Okay. But if you actually look at it, Okay, uh, so these are the distances from the this node one. Now, let's just see what are the distances from this node zero? What are the distances of these nodes from the node zero? Node zero itself is uh, at distance of zero from itself. It's at distance of one from uh, the node one. Here it's one, here it's one. It's at distance of two because like you have to traverse two edges, distance of two over here and distance of three over here. Basically, what you can see is that when we say that uh, I have to include all edges, uh, all nodes which are at distance of at most k from the uh, this node one in the first tree by connecting some node in the second tree. What I'm saying is that if I connect 
नोड यू एंट्री वन टू नोड वी एंट्री टू माय आंसर विल इंक्लूड ऑल नोड्स इन ट्री टू विच आर एट डिस्टेंस ऑफ के माइनस वन फ्रॉम वी ओके सो बेसिकली लाइक आई कनेक्टेड वन विथ जीरो ओर हियर एंड माई के वॉज टू सो वेन आई कनेक्टेड वन विथ जीरो ओर हियर द डिस्टेंस ऑफ जीरो इंक्रीमेंटेड बाय वन सो बिकॉज टू रीच फ्रॉम वन टू जीरो you have to like uh, zero itself had distance of zero from it and then zero had a distance of one from one so this zero became one then each of the nodes reachable from two uh, one was reachable with like uh, by traversing one edge but now you had this one extra edge so it incremented to two similarly for over here two became three this two became uh, this one became two and so on and so forth so basically uh, what we want to do is we want to connect uh, our node u in tree 1 to node v in tree 2 and add the answer of uh, like v2 for value of k equal to k minus 1 and also since we can just basically connect every node u to any other node v for it uh, calculating its answer what we can do is we can pre calculate the max value like uh, the maximum number of nodes max value of like number of nodes reachable from v uh, at distance of at most k minus 1 so basically what we do is we ca calculate this thing called the max target of uh, tree 2 which is the max number of nodes reachable from any other node in tree 2 with at most k minus 1 edges okay so let's just consider our current test case for our current test case we have uh this is our tree 1 so this is our tree 1 and this is our tree 2 fix now what we are saying is that for this tree we calculate for each node like from node 0 we calculate all no number of nodes that are reachable from node 0 uh, by traversing at most two nodes similarly we do so for node 1 from node 1 we started efs we calculate all nodes which are reachable by traversing at most k nodes or k edges and for this tree here to similarly we calculate the number of nodes that are that are reachable from each node by traversing at most 2 minus 1 equal to 1 node okay and basically like uh, from zero by traversing at most one node like you would be like from zero zero can reach itself zero can reach uh 1 2 3 so for zero this value will be 4 for one why this was in dragon sir uh okay someone has their mic on okay zero you can node uh, reach from node zero to two three one from 1 you can reach from node 1 to 0 uh, from 1 to 4 by traversing at most one edge like if you want to go to 0 you have to traverse two edges so that won't be considered so for 1 this uh, value would be 2 for 3 this will be like from 3 you can only reach to 0 so 1 from 2 you can reach to 0 or 7 so this will be 2 for 7 this will be learned because you can just reach 1 similarly for 5 6 this is 1 for this it is 3 and we take uh, similarly we over here we calculate the number of nodes reachable from each node basically from for zero by traversing two edges you can have 1 2 3 4 5 for one this value is 1 2 3 like 
one zero two that is three for two this value two would be five and for three and four these values would be three and three basically no sorry this will be four and four because from three you can go to three two four and zero so this will be like four and four and now what you do is that you take these values so for zero the value is five for one it is three then it is five and four and four this is your uh, value for tree one and you take your values two which are basically your four two 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 uh two i guess this one one and something so on and so forth and you take the maximum of these things so maximum value over here is four which is four and now you add this maximum value basically to this value one array and you get your answer array so you have five three five four four and in this you add your maximum value that that is four and finally you would get five plus four is nine four plus three is seven five plus uh, four is nine 4 plus 4 is 8 and 4 plus 4 is 8. So this is the uh, answer array that you would get. Basically, what does this uh, operation of adding to this array signify? What you are saying is that since the maximum number of nodes reachable are from 0, while calculating the answer of 0, I will add an edge from 0 to 0. Let me just show it in a different color. While calculating answer of 0, I will add an edge from 0 to 0. While calculating the answer from 1, I will add an edge from 1 to 0 while calculating an answer from 2 I'll add an edge from 0 to 2 and so on and so forth. Uh, this will be how we will like uh, this is the basic idea behind our uh, approach to solve this problem. So let's just see. Okay. And this is the code. So the first thing is basically we calculate the n and m. So the number of edges in an n size tree is n minus one. So you can just get the n and m by taking the size of the, the number of edges plus one. This is the value of n and m. Then this is the adjacency list for the n and m. Uh, initially, you just uh, create the adjacency list. Basically, iterate over all edges, add an edge from u to v, v to u. Similarly, for this second tree, adjacency one and adjacency two. Next, you calculate the max target. Okay, so for this, we have defined this function DFS over here. Now, what would DFS return? Well, DFS of u, uh, the DFS starting at node u with parent p, like parent p has been visited before, uh, with this adjacency value and k, this will return what is the number of nodes in the subtree of u that are at a distance of at max k from u. If k is less than 0, then I mean even u itself is at distance of 0 from itself. So you will have an answer of 0. Initially, you will say that result is 1. That is including u itself. We have at least one node which is at distance of k greater than or equal to 0. Uh, then for each of the nodes v in the adjacency of u, if v is not a parent of u, like basically v is a child of u, we start a DFS from v with parent as u, this adjacency list. And we say that what is the number of nodes that are at a distance of at max k minus 1 from v. Since any node that is at distance of at max k minus 1 from v will be at a distance of at max k from uh, u. Basically to say this, let's just say this is a node 0, this is 1, this is 2. Now 2, so if you are starting a DFS with k equal to 2 from uh, 0, like 0 is a distance of 0 from itself, 1 from 1 and 2 from 2 then you need to start a DFS of k equal to 1 from 1 because 1 is itself uh, at distance of 1 from it and 2 is at a distance of 2 from it. So if any node can reach 1 in x moves, then it can reach uh, 0 in x plus 1 moves. So basically, you decrement k by, uh, k by 1 to consider that fact. So this is our DFS function. Basically, what this DFS will do is We'll start at a node u and calculate the total number of nodes that you can reach from u cons uh, by moving at most k edges. So first, yeah, right. Basically, rather than calculating this, okay. 
basically what we are doing over here is we are calculating this array. So this first DFS uh, from I, like DFS of I minus one at distance two K minus one should give us four. The second DFS should give us two, one, so on and so forth. And rather than maintaining an array, we are just uh, like parallelly calculating the maximum value. So we iterate over all the nodes of the second tree, uh, calculate this DFS value. That is the number of nodes that are in range K minus one from this node. We take this maximum value, then we start an answer array and the, our answer would be this value. That is this five, three, four, four. That is the maximum number of nodes that are reachable in the first tree by traversing at most K edges. And this is the second uh, value, which represents the maximum number of uh, nodes that are reachable in secondary by traversing at most K minus one edges and one edge that we add in between. So that was about the second question. And if we look at the time complexity for this question, the time complexity would be like each DFS can take at most big of n time. Uh, like we have n nodes and n minus one edges. So like this is n times n, n plus n minus one, like at each DFS will take at most big of n times and we'll have a DFS at most n times. So our time complexity is big of n squared. Sorry, not just n squared, but also we have an another value m. So we can have m DFS on the tree m. So basically o of n squared plus m squared. And our space complexity would be big of n plus m because that would be due to this adjacency array. So we have an adjacency array of size n, which stores n minus one edges of size m, which has, which stores m minus one edges. So this will lead to big of n and big of m space complexity. Both of these things will fit into our given constraints because our given constraints are n m up to 10 power three. So this will be like around 10 power six big of sorry not 10 power 6 yeah this will be around 10 power 6 and this will be around 10 to the power 3 okay so i don't think there are any doubts okay uh moving on to the final question the final uh, the last question was maximize the number of target nodes after connecting two trees so this is a similar question except that the target definition in this case is different so in this case, we define that U is a target node of V if the number of edges on a path from U to V is even. In the previous question, if the number of edges on path from U to V was less than or equal to K, then U was a target. In this case, this is if the number of edges is even. And also node is always itself a target of itself. And we similarly have to calculate the answer array that we'll get after connecting at most uh, like exactly one node from first tree to exact one node in the second tree. And so let's take the first test case. Considering the first test case, even here too, like uh, it's, I guess in the first three, yeah. Let's just say that we are calculating the answer for node zero. We, we connect the this node zero with this node zero. And let's calculate how many edges do I need to reach node say one. So to reach node one, I need to traverse exactly one edge and in a tree there's exactly one path between any two nodes. So there aren't multiple paths. To reach node two, I need to traverse one edge. To reach node three, I need to travel two edges. To reach node four, I need to traverse two edges. To reach node zero, I need to traverse one edge. To reach node one, I need to traverse two edges. Two for three, I need to traverse two edges to reach node two. Three edges to reach node seven. Three edges to reach node four. Three edges, uh, sorry, four edges to reach node five and four edges to reach node six. Okay. Now I want to uh, calculate what is the number of nodes and of course zero edges to reach node zero itself. So I want to calculate what is the total number of nodes 
where I can reach by traversing an even number of edges. So you can see that zero is even, two is even, two is even. So yeah, zero is even, two is even, two is even, this two is even. And over here, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Basically, the answer for node zero is eight over here. And uh, like similar to our previous problem, even here we can connect a different edge for uh, while well, well calculating answer for each of the nodes. Okay. And uh, so this is our tree. And if I'm calculating the answer for one, I can also connect one to the node zero. And I guess in that case too, like all these two, two and this two and these four will remain constant. So we'll have a contribution of four from this tree. And for one, only this two will have it. So let's just see. If you look at the So one is a distance of zero from itself, one, two, three, and three. So these two uh, nodes are a distance even from itself. And the second tree will calculate uh, you know, four nodes. So we'll have total six nodes. Sorry, I think I missed one node. Yeah, this tree will calculate five nodes, not four nodes. This tree will calculate five nodes. So we'll have seven nodes. And the constraints for this problem are n is n and m are up to 10 power 5. So our uh, previous approach is of like, so n and m are up to 10 power 5 and greater than or equal to 2. So our previous approach of like uh, starting a DFS from each of the nodes won't work over here. We need to see, uh, find something, a better alternative to it. One thing that you should notice, like whenever we have uh, something like odd number of edges or say even number of edges we uh, usually this points to calculating parity of something so basically this concept of parity is that you assign so let's just say this is our node 0 4 if you say that my node is zero and since there's exactly one path from zero to one, what is, uh, do I need an odd number of edges to reach one or do I need an even number of edges to reach one? I need exactly one edge to reach one. So I need an odd number of edges to reach one. So let's just say that my parity is one and over here I need zero. So my parity is even. So, uh, and to move to two, I need exactly one edge. So my parity is odd over here. To move to four, I need like exactly one plus one, two edges, which implies that my parity for four is even. Similarly, my parity for three should be even. Basically what we are saying is that whenever I come at like, this is zero and how many edges do I need to reach this node? Okay, so I need one edge, two edge, three edge, and a fourth edge. So if you see, I need an odd number of edges to reach this node, an even number of edges to reach this node, an odd number of edges to reach this node, an even number of edges to reach this node. And let's just say that uh, zero itself has an even number of edges because we need zero edges, which is like kind of zero. So basically what we do is uh, we start, we start from zero and we see how many edges do I need uh, to reach this node, like odd edges or even edges, and we assign a parity to each of the nodes. And now what you will observe That's is cool. that, what you will observe is that from zero, you can travel to any of these nodes with even parity using even number of edges. But that's just, uh, that's not it. Uh, like that's not the only thing over here. You'll also observe that between uh, traveling between two and four, you also require an even number of edges. So basically, you travel from 
zero to two in an even number of edges. So this is even. You can travel from zero to four and in an even number of edges. So this is even two. And to travel between these two edges, you also need an even number because like basically what is this? So if this was say X and this is Y, then the number of edges over here would be X minus Y. Since this is even and this is even, this total uh, difference should have should also be an even difference. And also, let's just say, uh, let's just consider what if it was an odd parity. So you have something like this. So it requires one edge to reach up to here, three edges to reach up to here, and five edges to reach up to here. Okay. So this value is odd. This value is odd too. And this value, say this is X and sorry, not this value is odd, but this complete value is odd too. If this is X and this is Y, then the number of edges from one to three is like X minus Y. And so an odd number minus an odd number will give us an even number, right? Basically what we are saying over here is that you can reach, if you start assigning a parity of even or odd starting from zero, and basically if uh, this is my parent node, if it has a parity of odd, then I will assign the child a parity of even. If it has a parity of even, then I'll assign the child a parity of odd. What we are saying is that, from any even parity node, you can go to any other even parity node. Right. And basically like uh, this is the core idea over here that first assign parity, then uh, the number of nodes reachable from any node u is equal to the number of nodes v like number of nodes with same parity of with same parity as u okay so let me just uh show this to you on this example so uh for now like i'll just consider this tree like zero one two three so zero one, two, three, and four. All right. And you will start assigning parities over here. So initially, uh, zero is even. So rather than assigning even or odd parities, I will say that parity even is represented by zero. Parity of odd is represented by one. So zero is a distance of zero. It will be assigned parity zero. 1 will be assigned parity that is different than its parent, 1, 2 will be assigned parity 1, 3 will be assigned parity 0, 4 will be assigned parity 0. What you could see over here is that if I want to travel from any node with parity 0 to any node with parity 0, I need to travel exactly an even number of edges. Like this is 1, 2, this is 1, 2. And if I want to tra travel from any node with parity 1 to parity 1, I also need to travel an exactly even number of edges. This is like two edges. So what I'm saying is that the answer for all nodes, like answer for all nodes with parity zero is equals to the number of nodes with parity zero. And similarly for one, like answer for parity one is equal to number of nodes is that the parity of V is one. And you could also kind of observe this thing uh, in our answer. So if you actually see over here, the answer for, if you, if I were to say, like the answer over here is eight, seven, seven, and eight, eight. And this is like answer for zero, one, two, three, and four. And if you observe over here, like zero has a parity of zero, three has a parity of zero, four has a parity of zero, and one, two basically have these parities of one. And the number of nodes with parity zero is three. And also we have to connect it with another edge to a tree. We'll discuss that in just a short while. 
but basically this is the idea that if you had a single tree so to calculate answer for single tree this is our approach right and now moving on to the uh, complete problem the complete problem is of course that you have two trees and you can add a edge from this tree to this other tree like to any node while calculating answer for all nodes you can just choose any one of the nodes in this tree and add an edge to this other tree okay so what we want to do is basically if you uh, so while calculating the answer for one tree it's now we have a simple o of n way of calculating this answer basically we calculate the parity of all nodes and for each node its answer is number of nodes with this parity while calculating the answer for two nodes uh, like two trees what we can do is i can just say uh can, let me just see or how is the tree So this is our tree, right? While calculating the answer for this node, so these are the parities for this tree. And let's just say that we assign the parities starting from here. So parity of 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and 1. Okay. Now, consider what happens. I'll just consider a simpler tree because it would be easier to draw. So let's just say that we have these two trees. And the parities over here are 0, 1, 1 and 0, 1, 1. Like these two are different trees. This is tree 1 and this is tree 2. Okay. What happens when I add an edge from over here to here? Okay. What happens when I add an edge from this node to this node and start calculating parity from this node? So this is 0, this is 1, this is 1. This node gets assigned the parity of 1. This node gets assigned the parity of 0 and 0. Basically, you could see that the parity over here has flipped. Initially, it was 0. This is 1. This was 1. This was 0. This is 1. This is 0. One more thing that I can do is I can just assign, uh, I can join this node and this node. And in this case, we'll have our parities like 0, 1, 1. This will be 0, 1, and 0. And yeah, sorry, this is not 0, 1 and 0. This is like, this is 0. So this node will be assigned a parity that is different than this, that is 1. This will be assigned parity of 0. This after traversing this edge will be assigned parity of 1. So basically you can see that I have two options. Either I can assign this node to a node with parity of 1 and keep the parities as it is. Or I can uh, join this node to a node with parity of 0 then its parity has to be updated to 1 and this will flip all parities right and keep parities same basically what we are saying is that for each of the nodes uh, in the first tree we can have the number of nodes in tree 1 with same parity and represent parity by p and well, like we will have the maximum of number of nodes in tree 2 which have parity 0 or the number of nodes in tree 2 which have parity of 1 okay like why does this work <clears throat> so if you consider over here uh this array like these will have a parity of 0 1 1 and we can have something like this so this is parity of 0 1 1 now this uh node 0 what you want to do is if you attach this node 0 to this uh nodes now node 0 has parity of 0 when you attach it to 0 you flip the parities you could have 1 0 0 so you have the maximum of these things like the you you were able to add the number of nodes with parity one to your answer on the contrary if you had more nodes with parity one so for example if you had something like this this is your tree one with parity zero one one and if you had this tree with parity zero one one and if you had say more nodes with parity of zero so if you had something like this you could join this node to a node with parity of one and keep all the parities same in that case, you can add this uh, the nodes with parity 0 to your answer. 
this will have parity of zero. So basically what you can do is uh, in the first tree, you don't really have a choice. You can only include nodes which have same parity of the, as the current node. In the second tree, you have a choice to flip the parity. So you basically can add the number of nodes with parity zero or number of nodes with parity one. So that will be our uh, approach to this problem. And let's see. I don't think there's something. Right. I think there are no doubts. Right. So this is our first. This is our function. Uh, let's just say this is the, like in the previous case, we calculate the N and M number of edges and the number of uh, edges two. We have n minus one edges, so n will be edges dot size plus one. We'll calculate our two adjacency lists, and we maintain two parity vectors over here, and we basically DFS uh, from both of these like uh, zero nodes in both of the arrays, uh, both of the graphs, both of the trees, and for each like u v. Basically, what we are doing over here is that if I am at node u. If I am at node u and I have parity of zero, then my child v will have a parity of one. If I am at node u with parity of one, then my child v will have a parity of one. And then we can just calculate its own subtree and then it can calculate its own subtree. So what we say is for each v in the adjacency of uh, u, if v is not the parent, then assign the parity of u v to be opposite of the parity of u. And then just calculate the parities for the subtree of u. This is what we are doing in this DFS. So we calculate the parities for both of the trees. Finally, we over here, we calculate the max target tree two. Basically, this is the maximum of the number of nodes in tree two with parity zero and number of nodes in tree one with parity of one. Uh, this will be say our like maximum target. This is the thing that we are going to add into our tree one answer. And count zero is number of nodes with parity zero. Count one is number of nodes with parity of one. So calculating answer over here, we iterate over all nodes from node zero to n minus one. If my node has parity of zero, what can I do? I can reach to all nodes in the current tree, like in the tree one, which also have a parity of zero, that is the count zero. And in the tree two, Take the maximum of zero and one. Since we can flip, we can basically flip the parities by adding appropriate edges. So I can reach a maximum of uh, count zero or count one edges in the tree two. So basically, I can reach maximum target tree two edges. Uh, if my parity is one, like the number of uh, nodes I can reach in tree two remains similar. In tree one, I can only reach nodes that have a parity of one. That will be my answer. And this is our final answer. So speaking of the like time complexity for this, each of these DFS take O of N time, uh, O of N or O of M time, the number of nodes plus edges in the graph. So each of these DFS will take O of N and O of M time and this overall loop will take big O of N time. So our overall time complexity would be big O of N plus M. And our overall space complexity would be big of M plus M2 because we are storing an adjacency list over here, which will take big of N and big of M time, a big of M and big of N space. And we are also storing this answer array. So we get big of N space for this. So that will be our space at time complexity. And yes. Uh, so that was the last question of this. Maybe we. Right. So let's just like for once. Okay. So this was our space complexity, time complexity analysis, and this is our uh, function. So let me just recap through this once. We are calculating the number of nodes in both the trees. Here we are storing two adjacency lists representing each of the trees. We construct these adjacency lists. 
then we calculate the parity of nodes in each of the trees now in the second no, uh, in the second tree we can kind of flip the parity by adding appropriate edge if you add edge to a node with zero parity you will flip all the parities if you add uh, edge to a node with one parity you won't flip like the parities would remain same so we take the maximum of like frequency of zero or frequency of one then we calculate the number of nodes with parity zero and one in the first tree finally we go on calculating our answer one if uh, I iterate over all the nodes in the first tree if it has no parity of zero it can reach these many nodes in the second tree and in the first tree it can reach all the nodes with parity one uh, if it has parity one then it can reach these many nodes in the second tree and in the first tree it can reach the nodes with parity of one so that was our overall answer and this was the final uh, this was like the final problem thank you for joining